Marcus Omard here in the Nesson studio with U.S. soccer legend Landon Donovan. Hi, Landon. Welcome to Nesson, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Nice to be here. I want to start out with, uh, this is going to be my first memory of Landon Donovan. We were uh -oh. just talking off screen. <laughs> that World Cup qualifier in 2001 uh, was the first game after 9-11. And what I remember most about that day, I want to see if you remember this. After the game, you were out in the parking lot signing autographs. Oh, wow. Um, you had to be maybe 20 years old, 19 or 20 years old. At that time, did you know what you would mean to U.S. soccer? <laughs> um, well, I think at that time, like everybody, we were just happy to be playing soccer. Yes. After 9-11, we were happy to have the country sort of bonded and, and united in a way that probably hadn't been for a long time. Yeah. We were happy to win the game and excited, and that's probably why I was out in the parking lot <laughs> signing autographs, but that was a fun day for me, a fun game. It was uh, great, Joe Max Moore scoring a penalty kick that, right. that ended up putting us into the World Cup, so special day. Did you, is that something you had done uh, in the past at other games, whether at club or international level? Well, the reason I said wow is I didn't realize that I would have done that after a national team game, especially back when I started in San Jose, we used to go out after the game and sign autographs, but it was almost like obligatory because our fans sort of expected it, and, right. and that was something we did. But uh, with the national team, we rarely did that, so that was pretty cool. We must have been pretty excited. Yeah, <laughs> and now here we are almost 15 years later, uh, look how far Look how far you've come. Look how far uh, soccer has come. You're here with Liberty Mutual. You want to talk about that? Yeah, well, as you guys here locally know, uh, Liberty Mutual is a Boston-based company that has been a part of U.S. youth soccer for a long time, is now part of the U.S. national team. They are part of the Olympics. They're partnered with the Olympics, and they're uh, presenting the game tonight, the U.S.-Brazil game at Foxborough. Right, and you talk about staying connected. You uh, you retired last year in December. Uh, what have, what, how have you been spending the time since then? You're not training every day. Not You're training not traveling at all. With the boys. Um, no. no, it's you know it's weird because for so long my life had been structured. So yes. I knew on Monday I did this, on Tuesday I did that, on Wednesday I did that. Now I wake up a lot of days with a little like panic. I have something to do, and then I go, oh, wait, I don't have anything no, to do. Yeah. I can just chill out. <laughs> so it's been nice to have that. Uh, ability to do whatever you want most days right. um, but there are days like to, when I go to the game and watch the US Brazil game I'll sit there and say ah oh, I wish I was on that field yeah. playing you know but all the other parts you don't miss but the games you miss right and you still get those uh, maybe those goosebumps before the for game sure I have butterflies like watching and when you watch the game you say oh I want to be out there I could have done that but right. you know of course uh, it's not true. now you had played <laughs> Brazil against Brazil before and I'm thinking um, most famously in the Confederations Cup uh, that in, where you guys made it to the final, I think that was in 2009. Right. Uh, what, what memories do you have as a national team player against the storied yellow jersey of well, Brazil? Like most players, not great memories against Brazil because you almost always lost. They're, yeah. just a, they're a great team. But uh, I played probably five or six times against Brazil in my career, and it's always special because there's always this aura around them. Right? right. They always have some player that is greater than God, the biggest thing on earth. Yeah. And then their team is just special, and they have special players that play all over the world in great teams and in great leagues. So it's always a special game. I know for the guys playing against Brazil, they'll feel something a little bit different, and it'll be a lot of fun. Right. Is there something, is, is there something that you want to prove when you play against them? Well, that they have they come with these global reputations sure. that american players don't well, have well you want to test yourself right you want to see well i watch this guy every week play for chelsea i want to see what it's what it's like you right. know and it's different now because a lot of our players now play against these guys on sure. a regular basis but when i started playing if we were playing in major league soccer we want to know what it's like to play against the guy who starts for Barcelona every week or right. Real Madrid. So there was always something in that way. But you also know that everybody's watching. When Brazil plays, everybody watches. Right. So everyone around the world is watching this game, and you say, oh, this is a chance for me to showcase myself. Sure. Now, you talked about playing against Chelsea, playing against uh, Barcelona, these big teams, and you had, you had a chance to. Uh, I want to talk specifically about two loan spells at Everton. Uh, you went, they were both short term, maybe three months at a time. Right. What did you learn about yourself during those, uh, during those stints? Those, those experiences were great for me because I had played in Major League Soccer my whole career. I had played with the national team. I had played in World Cups and been successful. But you always wonder, you know, when you watch those guys play every week, you, you're, 
you're inspired by what they do and you admire what they do. But you wonder, could I do that? Can I hang at that level? You yeah. know, I know I play against them in a World Cup with great teammates around me, but can I go be a part of that? So I wanted to be a part of that and see if I was capable of it. Right. And, and having that experience was so valuable for me. So now I don't ever look back and go, hmm, I wonder if I would have been able to do that. Now I know, you know what, I can do that. Right, what if, what if. Now you, you also spent time at Bayern Munich, uh, and, and that was just another very brief loan spell. Uh, it turned out we, we remember it differently as uh, U.S. soccer fans. That was the, maybe that was the stint that didn't quite work out for Landon Donovan. Right. Uh, what do you remember most about well, Jurgen Klinsmann was there, and he yes. brought me. He was the one who uh, pushed for me to be brought there. Uh, I had a pretty good preseason there. I scored some goals, did well. When I look back, it would have been hard for me to play in that team because that team was very good. Right. And uh, I believe in my abilities, but there was a lot of great players ahead of me on that team. And so... I was disappointed that I didn't get to play more, but it was probably justified and I probably wasn't quite ready for that. Um, but it was a great experience that gave me the opportunity to train at that level, to play some games at that level, and it was another experience that helped me eventually in 2009 Confederations Cup, 2010 right. World Cup, and beyond. Uh, I want to go back even further. When you went to Bayer Leverkusen, you were just a teenager, maybe 16, 17 years mm -hmm. old. Uh, how did that experience shape your career? It helped me a lot, and the reason it helped me is not what people would think. I actually went to Germany when I was 17. I had come from America where I was this star right. with the under-17 national team on my high school team, and I went to Germany and quickly realized they don't care about any of that yeah. stuff. So they've got 25 other kids from all over the world that are just like you, and mm -hmm. they're just hoping that one of them makes it up to the first team. Right. So it was, a, it was a learning experience for me. Uh, while I didn't get to play there, and I wanted the chance to play, I didn't get to play much there, just the training, uh, the environment was so different than anything I had ever been a part of. When I trained with a high school team, it's much different than training with 17 and 18 year old professionals. So right. it was a great learning experience for me, and I think the things I learned there technically as a soccer player mm -hmm. helped me the rest of my career. Right, and what, what sorts of things, how do you take those experiences bring them back to either Major League Soccer or uh, whether it's a, you probably wouldn't be in a, at playing at a collegiate level, but let's say if you're in a NASL or USL team, how do those experience, how do you spread those out amongst your teammates to maybe raise well, the... I think that happened naturally because I remember when I was with the under 17 national team, I would go, I was with them part of the time, but I was also training in Germany part of the time. Right. And every time I came back, I had a different mentality, mindset, attitude on the field. I brought this competitiveness that I think the guys weren't used to or necessarily ready for right. but that's because the environment I was in so that was very beneficial and then the things you learn you learn you're not going to forget so once I learned certain things and had practiced them a lot right. I carried them with me the rest of my career and that helped you when uh, you went to the under 17 World Cup right and you won the golden ball you were Correct. The, uh, the best player of the tournament I think you guys finished third or fourth mm -hmm. how did that propel you into your uh, Well, your see, so the career. important piece of being in Germany at that time was I was one of the few players in this whole under-17 World Cup that was actually part of a professional club training and playing at a high level all the time. Right. So when I went there, I was um, ahead of the game in that way. And then that opportunity really gave me a chance to be recognized nationally and internationally and propelled me to, to starting my professional career, which was great. Right, and you chose to make your whole career essentially in Major League Soccer. In the United States, you were the first, uh, I call you, uh, I've written about you as the money player, um, the first million dollar contract, million dollar a year. You were making that money before the quote unquote Beckham rule, the designated player rule. Uh, what, what kind of responsibility did, did that come with? Um, there was a lot of responsibility with that. Um, I, you know, I sort of did that when it wasn't popular, and now um, a lot of guys are coming back and, and doing that, and that's great. And I think at the time, I wanted to be in America. I loved the league, Major League Soccer. I loved being in Southern California with my friends and family playing for the Galaxy. I wanted all that. So when it finally became viable, um, financially and from a competitive standpoint for me to stay, then it made sense to stay. And it was important enough to me 
that I probably forewent money and opportunity and maybe some popularity, but I wanted to be a part of what was growing here. And when you look at today, what's going on in Major League Soccer and right. with U.S. Soccer, it's pretty special to have been a part of that. Do you ever feel like you might have been a better player if you had stayed in Europe, uh, played your whole career there? So this is an interesting question because I have this discussion all the time with young kids now because they'll say, you know, I'm 18 years old, I have a chance to sign with the revolution. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know how much I'm going to play or I have an opportunity to go to Europe and be a part of a, a youth academy in Europe. And for me, the biggest thing at 18 was I was playing 30, 40, 50 games a year. So if you're a kid now, you could be training at Barcelona or you could be at Barcelona. If you're never playing games at that age, you're not going to get better. If you're 13, 14 and you're training at Barcelona, that's pretty good. Yeah. But if you're 18, 19 and you're training there, that's great. But eventually you got to play games. So. For me personally, it worked out to be playing games. And what I say to people is you have to play. So if you can go somewhere where you want to be, where you think it's a better environment, wherever that might be, South America, Mexico, Europe, great, do it. But make sure you're playing games. If you're not playing games, it doesn't matter. And if you stay here and you're a homegrown kid for the revolution who they developed, they're going to push you and they want you to succeed. When you go to Europe, they don't really care. And you're just you know, a number. You're just a number. Right. So you have to remember that. It doesn't mean one is better than the other, but each situation is different. And for me, the most important was the experience of playing games. Right. Now, are you, you, you are the second highest, uh, second most caps in U.S. soccer history, most goals, uh, most assists. I've called you the best player the United States is, has produced. Yet there's been this criticism of you really that's gone on for since you came back from Europe that Landon isn't um, isn't as good as he should have been or wasn't as good as he should have been uh, did, did those criticism that ever get to you uh, how much did yeah, you listen to that? I'm human right so when people say that uh, you think about it um, but at the end of the day it was a very simple equation for me it was do I want to be one of many in, in some league and go sort of unknown and be obscure and you know maybe play 10 games a year or 20 games a year in and out as a starter maybe play a lot of games but in a league and a team that's not well known and that's you know whatever or do I want to be a part of something bigger than that at the same time be able to be happy and for me it was always about happiness whatever made me my friends my family happy is what mattered to me so the 90 minutes on the field when you're when I was at Everton or Bayern Munich or Leverkusen when I was younger, fantastic, um, just like they were in LA. But the other 22 and a half hours of the day, you sit around going, gosh, I wish I was doing this or I wish I was home or I could be doing, you know, and, right, and it's, a right. lot, it's a lot more difficult. So the reality is, is I have to live the life. Other people can watch and say, well, you should do that. Should but be, right. we all have to live our life. So we all have to make the decisions that are best for us. And I always chose to do what made me happiest. Right, and you also were, um you had a fiance and then got married at that young, at that you know very early stage of your career. Right. Uh, when I look at it, you know, I say, of course he wants to be in California. That's where his wife is. That's where. Well, anyone who's ever been is. married knows that if your wife's not happy, you're not happy. Right. So you got to take that <laughs> into consideration. Yeah. So so happiness always played a big part uh, in your career. And another person who really shaped you, I wanted to ask about, was Bruce Arena. Mm -hmm. uh, he's the uh, the dean of U.S. Soccer Coaches. You worked with him on the national team for eight years. Mm -hmm. Worked with him on the Galaxy for you know forever. How how much did he mean for your career? Well, Bruce brought me into my first full national team camp when I was 16, and they played Argentina at uh, RFK Stadium in DC. And uh, Joe Max Moore scored. Joe Max day. Moore scored, <laughs> and I was just there as a part. I wasn't part of the roster or anything. I was just there to experience it. And Bruce, I, I realized early that Bruce got it. Like, he understood. He knew I probably wasn't going to play for a few years, but he said, this is a kid who's got potential. We're going to bring him and let him sit and experience this and see what it's all about. Mm -hmm. So I've known him since I was 16. I've known him half my life. He's yeah. been my coach for 10 or 12 or 14 years. And um, we have tremendous respect for each other. And I, I just, I love Bruce as a person. He's a, he's a very good person. He comes off a little hard in public, but... He's a good man and a, a great coach, obviously. Right, and can you talk about the environment that he uh, helped, helped create with the Galaxy? I know you were part of the 2005 MLS Cup 
champion team. Mm -hmm. And then there was a gap of uh, maybe five or six years before you guys won another title. Right. Uh, what changed in that time in between? Well, Bruce is, he knows soccer. He knows the soccer landscape. He knows Major League Soccer. And he's a great evaluator of talent. Um, but his biggest attribute is his ability to connect with people mm -hmm. and to manage people. So when he came in, uh, immediately there was a level of respect that he commands, but there was also a sense of relief because I knew as one of the leaders of the team that everybody could just relax, do what they're good at and play soccer and all the other stuff he doesn't worry about. If you want to go out and have a beer after practice on a Tuesday, fine. You know, don't go out on Friday night and have beer, but if you want to go live your life and be a person, a human being, great. Just make sure you show up and be a professional when it's time to be a professional. And that allowed everyone to just be themselves, and eventually we won. Right, and not everybody operates that way. There are other coaches who... No, oh, there's obviously a lot of coaches in different sports and in different realms that, that treat things differently, and that's fine. Everyone's got their own style, and some things work for some players and other things don't, but for that group of players, that's what worked best. Right. Now... In, when you guys went to the World Cup in 2002, that was the best performance the United States ever had at a World Cup. What did that team have that maybe was missing from 2016, 2010, uh, 2014? We had the perfect blend of experience and youth, and we were fearless in a way. So uh, we had all these veteran players, Claudio Reyna, McBride, Josh Wolf, Jeff Agus, Eddie Pope, Brad Friedel, Casey Keller, uh, Kobe Jones, who were all in the prime of their career. And then you had a few of us, uh, Clint Mathis was up and coming, myself, Demarcus Beasley, who gave a little edge to the group, which was good and needed. Um, but people forget, and this is the same with every World Cup, we could go through every World Cup from 2002 all the way on, it's very small, the margin between advancing and not advancing right. out of your group. So we, we lost our last game in the group, and if Korea didn't beat Portugal, we would have never gone on this great run. Right. Uh, last year in the World Cup, uh, the U.S. advances out of the group. But if Ghana ends up beating Portugal and they had a chance in the 70th minute right. to score a goal against Portugal, all of a sudden you go crashing out and it's a big failure. So the margins are always very small in all of that stuff. Um, but we got the, the breaks we needed, the little bit of luck we needed, but we also deserved to be where we were, so it was a great tournament. Right, and I, I have to ask you about the 2014 World Cup. Uh, we know it hurt you not to be there. Uh, what do you think was might have been missing from from that team? I know they got out of the group and that was a, that was a great accomplishment, um, but is there something you felt, obviously, you could have added to that team? Well, of course. I mean, I, 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 think, I think experience in a World Cup is very important, and uh, it's not the only thing that matters, but there's things that happen in a World Cup that, that you can't prepare for unless you've been there. So I was right. watching, uh, this year I went to the Women's World Cup final, and I saw after, the, after they won the game, actually after the semifinal game, sorry, I saw Abby Wambach, who hadn't hardly played at all during the World Cup, in the middle of the group of girls talking and, and so excited to see the team win and just be a part of what, what that meant. And I can only imagine what was going on behind the scenes the whole tournament with Abby. Right. Of course she could have been disappointed, she could, but when you get to that point in your career, that doesn't matter. You just want to be a part of it and right. help the team be successful. And you could see that in her. So that part for me was tough because I knew I could have provided that. But I thought the team did did well. I mean, it was tough circumstances, but, um, you know, if, if obviously I'm biased, but if I had to say there was something they lacked, it, it seemed like they lacked a little bit of that, and that would have been helpful. Okay. Well, Landon, uh, thank you for being here with us.